Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. It is Sunday, the 23rd of August. And do you know, actually, it marks 23 weeks since we last actually had a physical church meeting in this building. It was on the 15th of March. And today marks the day when it all begins to change for us. So uh, a number of people will be meeting here with me. Uh, but I know that we can't accommodate everybody. And I know some of you are still shielding because of the pandemic. So we are going to be continuing these online services. And I'm so grateful that you've been able to join us this morning. We're going to be continuing these throughout September. And the aim is that from the beginning of October, we're going to live stream the services which are happening here. So we all get to see and experience the same service. But for now, we are going to start with a song. This is a song. It's a Kingfisher song. It's called Proclamations. And it starts with the words, you are the God of new beginnings. You restore the desert place. We're going to start with this amazing declaration of who our God is. Join in with me.
Well, before we start, I really want us to pray together. This is a, I think this is a landmark day. I think this is a day which is sort of launching us into this new season. And I want to pray for each one of us. I want to pray for the Holy Spirit to just come and fill us, just come and inspire us, just to get us ready for all that God wants to do in this next few months. So pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you that after all these months of wondering what's going on, Lord, we thank you that we are now able to meet together in a more tangible and physical way. But Lord, I pray that whether people are in the building together or whether we are just gathering here online, Lord, I pray that you would come and speak to us this morning, speak to our minds Speak to our hearts, come and stir us into action. Lord, that we might know you more. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning's message really serves as an introduction to what I want to talk about over the next few weeks. And the Bible verses we're we're starting and finishing with this morning, they come from The Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, uh, it's two verses, verse 15 and 16. Feel free to follow along in the notes. These are some of the last recorded words of Jesus as he sent his disciples out. And he said, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. It doesn't get clearer than that. I love those two words, everyone and anyone. So at the start of this new season, we are going to get back to some Kingfisher foundations. I mean, lockdown, for all its stresses and losses, has been a, a pause on so much of what we were doing. And, you know, it's been a great time for reflection And to think about why we do the things we do and why we do things a certain way. And church has been no different in that respect. We've had to adjust and adapt to the current situation. And things have looked and still look very different to how things were six months ago. You know, this building was a a busy place. And community was thriving through our our toddler and parent groups, support groups, youth groups, through the work of treasure seekers here. But for the last five months, we haven't been able to run any of those groups here. And this place has been empty for most of the week. With so much of what we did stripped back, the question I've been asking is, who are we then? Actually, church is not the sum total of our activities. Church is not limited to what happens in this building, and the lockdown we've been experiencing doesn't dictate the effectiveness of our being. In fact, for the first seven years of our existence as a church, we didn't even have a building to call our own, and yet the church grew. You know, church is the people of God, called to proclaim His kingdom come to build healthy, healing community and to be sent out to deliver good news. It's certainly been tougher to do that together when we have been socially distanced, but thank God for technology, right? Thank you to all those who who, who have pushed past the awkwardness of Zoom to stay connected and to support other people. You know, thank you to all those who have been intentional in in making phone calls and sending messages who have shown kindness and care through shopping for others or delivering meals or, or helping out when you can. That is all part of being part of a healthy church community. I mean, thank you to all those who have been praying for those who have made online church possible, who have shared your stories, who have videoed yourself singing or playing an instrument so that we can have a virtual band. Thank you to those who have been running online groups. You know, in so many ways, our church has been alive and active, and we know that people have been reached in ways that they weren't necessarily before this pandemic started. 
But what does it mean for us going forward? Are we just going to go back to the way things were? Or are there things we can learn from this testing time? I mean, what might God be saying to us as we start to gather together physically again as his church in Treadworth? Six years ago, when I became the pastor here, I started with a series called Get Set Go. If you were here, I don't know if you remember it. The word set was an acrostic for stop living in the past, embrace the present, and take hold of God's promised future. You know, well, today feels like a reset. We can't go back. We need to embrace the place where we currently are and look for the opportunities in it. And it's certainly a season to be re-envisioned about all church can be as we've paused from just keeping everything going as was. So that's why I've entitled this series Kingfisher with a question mark. Kingfisher? (laughs) You know, over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack what that means. Why are we called that as a church? What was in God's heart as he launched us back in 1993? What was the mission he called us to as a local church with international links? You know, many years ago, our senior pastor, James Byrne, wrote a book called Fishing for the King, describing how our church came into being and what its purpose was. And I want to encourage every one of us to read it or to read it again as we take a fresh look together at what it means to be a king fisher, a fisher for the king. You know, now how we engage with the world and how we organize things now might be different to when it was written, but our mission here hasn't changed in 27 years. And the eight-step strategy that the James outlines in his book to to outwork that mission is still as relevant today as it was back then, despite the world changing around us. And I want us all to re-engage with it. If you've been at Kingfisher for any length of time, you'll, you'll know our mission statement well. To reach lost people and to see them transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. However, when life is busy and, and stressful, it is it's so easy to go into maintenance mode, to skimp on relationships, to, to, for faith to grow cold. You know, it's a danger for all of us. At the end of our series in July called In the Light, I highlighted some verses from the book of Revelation, a letter from Jesus to the church in Ephesus, where he says that he's seen their hard work, he's seen their patient endurance. But then he says this, But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me. And did at first. You know, well, those words have really stuck with me. And as we come back together, I'm convinced this is what God is saying to us again right now. You know, to some of us, it is simply, turn back to me. If you are present this morning and and you are not in a relationship with God, if you are not living in the freedom of God's love, if you don't know the joy of his forgiveness or, or the hope of the life to come, then today is the day to make that turn back to God. In St. Peter, St. Peter's first, first sermon, as he stood preaching to, to thousands of people in Jerusalem, he said this, find this in Acts 2, verse 38. He said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To repent, remember, it means to turn back. Turn back to the best, to come 
to Jesus, to receive the forgiveness and the rest that he so freely offers us through his death and resurrection. Don't put that decision off for one more day. Let's plan your baptism. Let's be praying for you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, for others of us, God is also saying, and to the works you did at first. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. He wants to reignite a love for him in us. And for others that will, will move us to, to reprioritize what we are giving our time and attention to so that he comes first. It's the only way to truly know and fulfill his good, pleasing and perfect will. I mean, the greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. When you truly love someone, you want to be with them. You want to please them. You want to serve them. Let's not compartmentalize our faith. Let's not keep God in a box that we only get out on a Sunday or on special religious occasions. My relationship with him is meant to influence everything I do and everything I say. My love for him determining the, the decisions I make and the responsibilities I take on. It's the only way to safeguard my life from the thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the only way to experience life in all its fullness that Jesus said he had come to bring us. You know, when I first turned to Jesus many years ago, it wasn't just to get a free pass to heaven when I die. It wasn't to make me feel better when I hit a crisis. It wasn't for him to, to validate my feelings and decisions. It was for him to come in and not only be my saviour, but also be my Lord. I am not Lord of my life anymore. Jesus is. Do you hear that? I am not Lord of my life anymore. Jesus is. Jesus is. Some of us find it really difficult to give up control to him. None of us should underestimate the, the fight of faith that it is. It will feel like a battle at times, but it is vital that we stay in that place of, of surrender to him, seeking his will rather than my will. If we're going to be the church that he needs us to be. So to those of us here this morning who, who call ourselves Christian, God is saying, enough with the distractions. Enough with chasing after the things of this world. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Today is a day of decision for all of us. Because as we start this new season, God needs us positioned and ready and equipped for his purposes. You know, whether you are exploring faith right now or whether you have been a Christian for years, I'm praying that this series is going to, to captivate you and inspire you and fire you up to want to wanna know God more and to live according to his mission for your life. I'm going to be sending some study notes out to the Connect group so that we can all be talking about this and encouraging each other. And at the same time in, in the six o'clock services, which are going to continue just online for now, James is going to be going through our core values as a church. So for all those wanting to understand what our church is about and what we do and why we do it, can I encourage you to read that book, Fishing for the King? We've got so many copies. If you want a copy, I'll send you one. And commit to listening in on a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening. Back in January at our vision morning, James was reminding us again of this great commission, the last orders of Jesus to go, to make disciples, to baptize and to teach. 
He's been preparing us for such a time as this. So let's appreciate this time of pause. Let, let's re- press that reset button. Let's focus on who we are and what God wants us to do as Kingfisher Church in this season of our lives. So I thought to kick this series off, it would be really helpful to talk to the man who started it all back then. If you are new to church, then let me introduce you to our senior pastor, James Byrne. <laughs> well, it's, it's great to have you joining us here oh, thank on you. Sunday morning. It's been a while, isn't it? I think the last time was back in January at our vision morning. I think you're right. Yes, the vision morning, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, most people, I'm sure, will know James really well. If you've been around Kingfisher, James is the man who began it all back in 1993. Yeah. Uh, so, James, the first question I want to ask is 28 years ago, mm-hmm. so before Kingfisher even started, God gave you a vision for a church. I mean, what did that look like in your mind? Uh, well, um, actually, it was uh, when Jan and I were at a, a conference in, um, in uh, Birmingham, and it's during one of the breaks, and um, the, the conference was on building a church for the unchurched, but uh, during one of the breaks, God gave me this vision, um, out of the blue, really, and the vision was of a map and on the map were red dots, and those red dots were were connected to each other. And as I looked at that uh, that vision, God uh, spoke to me and said, "I want you to build a church that has both a, a national and an international impact, but not just uh, one church, but a whole network of interconnected churches." These were the dots that were connected up. Um, and that these churches would cater mainly uh, would, uh, would 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 cater for rather different people than uh, you'd normally find in church. Mm. Churches normally cater for the already convinced, but he challenged us to launch churches that were specifically for the unchurched, mm. the unconvinced, those who would not normally go within a, a million miles of, mm-hmm. of of church, and. Uh, certainly wouldn't um, be thinking of considering the, the claims of Christ for themselves. Mm. And he um, challenged us to, to create this network of churches that existed to reach the unchurched, not uh, religious, not principally for the already convinced, but mm. relevant, contemporary, presenting the gospel and living out that gospel to the world around us, all in one break. <laughs> I remember first hearing about Kingfisher uh, back in 1992, when ah. you first started talking to a few people about it and just feeling so excited about the possibility of what God might do with a bunch of broken people like us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what was it for you that captivated you so much about this vision that you were literally willing to do whatever it took. I mean, do you, in one sense, that's quite a difficult question to answer because my response would really be, uh, how can you not have your ha- heart <laughs> captivated by that? If that isn't going to captivate your heart, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, you know, who would not get, in, get excited about that? But I think I'd also say that, that one of the marks of receiving a challenge or a calling from Jesus Christ is that it ruins you for anything else. Once you hear God saying, this is what I want you to do, it becomes the only thing that uh, that, that cuts it. Uh, it, it, And that could be about any uh, Mm. area of of life. Um, And uh, if it's a genuine Holy Spirit moment, then... um, one of the ways that we can discern whether it is a genuine Holy Spirit moment or not is that it, it grips you mm. and excites you and makes you feel completely out of your depth. But at the same time, you, mm. you, you can't now think of, of doing anything else. <laughs> you know, you might be out of your depth, but you don't want to swim anywhere else. Yeah. So God's calling carries with it uh, a conviction, I think, that, mm. uh, as I say, ruins you for anything else. Now... On a human level, there's nothing quite so amazing and satisfying as seeing people 
who are far away from God, mm. uh, actually finding him and starting a relationship with him. And you get to see them grow and mature as, as, as Christians and, mm. and change and develop before your eyes. Uh, it's just an incredible privilege and uh, mm. it never gets old. We've seen so much over the last almost three decades now. It's heading to, yep. um, by the grace of God, we are still here. Uh, <laughs> it might not look exactly the same as it did back then, but what do you think it is that makes Kingfisher Kingfisher? Huh, well, huh, what is it? Yes. So at Kingfisher, we've always had a sense of mission. Uh, now, our mission... I can almost hear people thinking, I know what that mission is. <laughs> Our mission is to reach lost people and see them transformed mm. into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Everything we do is to fulfill that mission. We're also a community that has always prioritized character over reputation, reality over image so consequently we are not and this is all part of what makes kingfisher <laughs> kingfisher but we are not the most shiny the most showbiz the most image conscious church around mm. but uh, we are a family of churches that are shaped by the people that god sends along so we're not a, a pre-packaged box that you've got to fit in mm. Uh, but the, the the church is the shape of the people that are, are there, yeah. and um, and we've always encouraged people to be willing to step out of the comfort zone and to trust that where God guides, God provides. Mm. So Kingfish has always attracted the lost, the spiritually and emotionally struggling those who would not normally go within a million miles of church mm. to come and look for answers. And these are the kind of things that make Kingfisher, Kingfisher. Fantastic. Well, back in 1993, the world was a very different place to the world we find ourselves in now. I mean, we had challenges back then. Mm -hmm. just, but there's just a few of us trying to launch this, this vision that, that God had given you. Uh, but what do you think the challenges are for us now in the 21st century, <laughs> what are the challenges now? What, how does it differ from then well, to now? Oh, well, you know, in one sense, uh, everything is different. In another sense, um, not a lot is different. Uh, yeah, we live in a very different environment, that's for sure, uh, than when we started 28 years ago. We live in an environment of a lot less hair now <laughs> <laughs> than we did we back do. then. Uh, but back then, there were no mobile phones, uh, so there was no social media. Mm. Uh, there was no internet. There was no Netflix. Uh, <laughs> there was no Spotify. CDs were just coming in, and I said at the time, I said, these will not last, and I have been proved right. Uh. As um, and who, who buys CDs anymore, <laughs> right? I know. Um, and um, people then had rather more respect for political leaders. Uh, this country had a more recognisable Judeo-Christian ethos about it. Uh, churches would, were able to start up without risk assessments, <laughs> uh, insurance, um, performance uh, licences. They were more innocent times, let's just say that. Mm. And yet some things haven't changed, I would say. Um, yes, we need to continually rethink how to make the message mm. relevant uh, and understandable. And yes, we need to recognize that uh, the adults today, let alone children today, um, are not growing up with any idea at all about uh, the Christian faith, not, mm. not even a residual memory. Yeah. Um, uh, and indeed, not really uh, growing up with any sense of uh, the notion of objective truth at all. Mm. But um, but people are still people. Mm. These things haven't changed. They're still lost. They're still looking for something to help them make sense of life. Yeah. They're still hoping to find something that is actually real and uh, that, that actually delivers what it says on the tin that'll add meaning and, and, and purpose to their lives. Mm. People are still aware of feelings of pointlessness and senselessness, and it's still 
the real challenge for the church to be people who accurately portray the incredible good news that God loves them, that Jesus died for them, that mm. he, he rose from the dead and that he now lives in heaven, inviting us into that relationship. Come on. This has not changed. <laughs> people still need that relationship yeah. that changes everything. So with regards to people, very little has changed. With regards to God, nothing has changed. Oh, man. So um, finally then, as our senior pastor, uh, how w w what advice would you give to us here in Treadworth as we aim to take that vision forward and to, to, to outwork it here in, in Treadworth in 2020? Yeah, these are really great questions <laughs> <laughs> that I've been thinking about. Mm. I would say this, that we are still pioneers. Mm. We're still called to be pioneers, not settlers. And we're beginning, um, as uh, I think you've already said, to, to re-look at our core values in the evening services over the coming weeks. Mm. One of those core values, the final uh, the seventh core value says this, we shall never arrive. Yeah. We shall continue to expand and grow until the whole world is pursuing full devotion. Mm. And that isn't about growing a, a, a great big church mm. or increasing our prominence amongst other churches in the neighborhood. It's about choosing to continue to be pioneers, mm. choosing to continue to do whatever it takes to reach the lost. And it means not settling for just where we've got to not doing what we've always done just mm. because that's safe you know our world has changed probably forever mm. but the needs of the people who live within it mm. have not changed they still need to be shown that there is a god in heaven who loves them who died for them who is now calling them to an incredible mm. uh, life of, of, of amazing purpose and healing and hope with an amazing future awaiting them. And God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know what? We are always going to have challenges facing us. You were mentioning that right at the beginning, 28 years ago, we had a lot of challenges. This is the, probably the only constant, <laughs> apart from God, <laughs> is the challenges. In fact, one of the earliest prophetic Words given to us um, in, in Kingfisher nearly 28 years ago, the very early days of Kingfisher was Isaiah chapter 54, verse 11. And it, it says this, O afflicted city, lashed by storms and not comforted, I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with lapis lazuli. I have no mm -hmm. idea then or now what lapis lazuli is, but it sounds great. What it's saying is, look, times have always been tough. These are not the only tough times mm. we've faced. The answer to this, and this is what I would say, the answer to this is not to fix our eyes on those tough times, yeah. but to fix our eyes on Jesus, mm. who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's what I want to say to Treadwith Church. That's what I want to say to Westgate Church. It's what I want to say to Spain, to India, to Malawi, to Mozambique, mm. to Zimbabwe, to Kenya, to Northern Ireland, to Southeast Asia. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Mm. Put your trust in him. Fully rely on him and step forward. Mm. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to have a pastor who has stood the test of time who has not given up when the going has got tough. And well, there's been many tough things over the years, but you yeah. have always encouraged us to do that, to keep our eyes on Jesus and to keep our eyes on what he has called us to do. So thank you, everybody. One of the wisest men I know. Oh, standing the test of time, like Graham Kendrick songs. They stand the <laughs> test of time. <laughs> Bring back Graham Kendrick. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, back in 1992... I remember Rach, my wife, and I meeting with James and Jan and being, being captivated by this vision for a church, Kingfisher Church. It's what's kept us 
he has kept us grounded all these years. So let me read you just a very quick excerpt from Fishing for the King. Maybe God is going to stir your heart too. It says this, We realized that if we truly wanted to reach the lost, we had to really appreciate the world the lost live in. The world in which the fundamental concern is not so much being worried about dying, but worried about living. And if we were asking people to give up an hour on Sunday morning to come to church, we had to give them a reason that was more compelling than the pull of washing the car, playing football, reading the paper, or staying in bed. We had to admit that our past experience of church was not something that was likely to drag the average person out of bed on a cold Sunday morning. And yet, God had gripped us with a vision of the possibility of seeing broken lives made whole and hopeless people transformed. So we resolved to give our lives to building a biblical community where Christianity was so evidently in operation that even the most hardened cynic would find their curiosity getting the better of them. Who wouldn't want to be part of a church like that? A rescue shop at the gates of hell. A place of restoration, reconciliation, and training so that we can be who God created us to be and do the things that he has planned for us to do. Here's what Jesus said again. Here's those words. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. I mean, what a privilege to be part of that. What a responsibility that we have been given. Let's not squander another day, but let's get ready and set to go. If you are considering crossing the line of faith this morning and making that turn back to God, then right now, I'm sure there's a real battle going on in your mind and in your heart. I mean, what will it mean? How will it change me? All I know is that God doesn't show any of us the whole journey. He's just asking you to trust him with the next step. It is a journey of faith. Thankfully, he is a good God who knows the end from the beginning, who loves us the most and knows us the best, who has eternal plans for us that are better than anything I could engineer on my own. And I know that as truth. I know that as a fact in the many, many years since I became a Christian back in 1982. Getting to know him and becoming like him is a lifelong process but inviting him in to be your savior and your Lord is a moment. It is an event that will transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into his eternal kingdom. It's a moment that is likened to being born again, washed clean from the past, given a hope for the future. It's not the words of a prayer that will save you, but the heart decision that I am going to put my trust in Jesus, trusting in his death on a cross and accepting his payment for my sins so that I can be reconciled to God and come alive to a relationship with him. If that's you, then I'm going to pray. And if you want to know him like that, then pray this along with me. Lord Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life. I know that I am a sinner and that I cannot save myself. No longer will I close the door when I hear you knocking. By faith, I gratefully receive your gift of salvation paid for by your death on a cross. I choose to trust in your resurrection and the promise of the life to come. And I am ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. So please come into my heart. Forgive me. 
Restore the broken parts of me and transform me into the person you created me to be. Lord Jesus, help me to follow you faithfully from this day forward. Amen. If you have called on the name of Jesus this morning, then you are saved. And you can now bear the name Christian. Your first task as a newborn baby in Christ is to tell somebody. You know, give us the chance to celebrate with you in the same way they are celebrating in heaven right now. But I also want to pray for the rest of us too. You know, some of us have become battle-weary, jaded. We've just got distracted or our faith has been compromised by the way we have been living and we are barely lukewarm, let alone on fire for Jesus. Today is a day for us to make a decision to, to turn back to God and to commit to doing the things that he wants us to do. So if that's you, then pray this with me now. Father, I confess that through my busyness and through my desire for the things of this world, I've lost sight of you. I'm sorry for the times when I have just done what I want with no thought to what you want. Forgive me for trying to be Lord of my life instead of being guided by you. And as I turn back to you today, come and take your rightful place in my life once again. Come and revive me and renew my love for you and restore to me the joy of your salvation. Lead me in your ways and in your truth that I might play my part in seeing your kingdom come and your will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Again, if that was you, tell somebody. Get someone to pray with you, to pray with you. If you're with somebody now, wherever you're watching from, whatever room you are in, if you're with somebody else, talk about it. Tell each other what God has been challenging you with this morning. And see today as a brand new start. Because the point is that I want us to come back next week alert and ready to hear more about this amazing mission that God is sending us on. your rule and reign in our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil your why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now Church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and price. To see the captives' hearts release the hurt. The sick, the poor at peace We lay down our lives for heaven's cause We are your church We pray revive this earth Street.
Reaching the near and far No force of hell can stop Your beauty changing hearts You made us for much more than this Awake the kingdom seed in us Fill us with the strength and love While these services are not meant to be just something that we sit in and watch and then we forget about it for the rest of the week, I'm really believing that these are opportunities for God to speak to us, to, to stir us up, to challenge us, to move us forward, to change us. So in whatever way God has been speaking to you this morning, spend some time just in his presence. Spend some time praying to him. Read your word this week. Talk to people this week. And I hope to see you back here at the same time next Sunday morning. Have a good week, everybody.
Yeah.